right, and followed by her will be Jean Gore. So let's give both of these women a Secretary of State for Abraham Lincoln. 100 years ago, Harriet Tubman was 91 years old. And she didn't have much longer to live on this earth. On March 10, 1913, she passes away from pneumonia. <coughs> but on this particular night in 1912, in early December, she is there with her family around her. Many of her brother's children and grandchildren were there talking to her. Some of them had never met her before because they lived all the way in Canada and they'd come down to Auburn to see her. Mother Harriet! Mother Harriet! Were you really a slave? You don't look like you could have been a slave. Say it another. 
my slave. But instead of hitting him, it hit me right here. <coughs> it cracked open my skull and I fell down. I was out for two days. But on the third day, I picked myself up from that floor where they had put me at. Working in that flax patch with blood and sweat coming all down my head. Yes, child, I was a slave. Mm -hmm. Ooh, slave be trying to get me down. But with that hitting my head, I started having visions. I be working. You could poke me, hit me, whip me, yell at me, but I wouldn't wake up. But when I did wake up, oh, I had visions of me flying in the sky, going to the north. Oh, there were white ladies, lovely white ladies helping me over a fence. Sometimes there was angels in the voice of the Lord just talking to me. Ooh, and the music I heard is nothing on earth like that music that I heard. Then there were other times when there were horsemen and they were racing on these horses and they'd be coming through and they'd be snatching babies from their mamas and mamas from their children. Oh! Master found out what happened and that I wasn't riding my head no more, that I fall asleep. He didn't want to have no more to do with me trying to sell me off to the neighbors. When they heard about what happened, none of them would pay, pay a pity for me. <laughs> but then the other slaves, they started saying, she, she got the charm, she got the touch. Do you know, she could tell you about the future. Ooh. And I was kind of elevated in their eyes. Ooh. And they started looking to me to be a leader. <laughs> oh, yes. Sometime after that, I could be working with my papa. He was working with um, John Stewart in his timber business. And, and my, my master brothers, he hired me out to him to work with my, my papa. Have him watch over me and my head. <laughs> Ooh, I could chop that wood. <clears throat> I could pick up the weight of the wood. <clears throat> More than the men around me. I might not be riding my head, but I was strong. And my papa, he was in charge of Mr. Stewart's timber. He could sit in this tree now. Now you see this tree there? See the grain of this tree? Yes, yes. This tree will make a good little cradle for the master's new baby. Yes, yes, yes. And then he go to this tree and say, this tree, you leave it alone for a little while. Another couple of years. Now don't touch that one. He was in charge of it. And all the white folk in town trusted my father. He worked on that reputation, he, his reputation. He was an honest man. And when I told him about my visions of flying to the north, now these lovely white ladies <coughs> hopping me over a fence, and he heard me telling them that I wanted to be free. And he taught me about the north star, and how to fall over this, the only star that don't move in the sky. Good Lord, put it there for me, just for me to get to the north. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he told me that the moss grows on the north side of the tree. Yes, he did. Oh, he did. And he told me how to move through the forest. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I go quiet. And how to mark the trail. So we'll go bound and bound in circles. Oh, my papa, he took good care of me. He taught me so much. They had met another man there too. His name was John Tubman. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I love me some John. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, ooh. John was free. But he was only free in his body. He was a slave.
slave in his mind and in his heart. I told him that I wanted to be free. That one day I'll run to the north and he'd be free. He'd come join me. And we could live in the north and get real good pay for our work. The children, he told me. He said, no, hey, you can't be <coughs> talking that way. Now, you keep talking about running, run away. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell Master Brodus on you. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell Master Brodus on you. You can't be running off. His words were laughing to me. But I wouldn't let him destroy my spirit. I would not, I would not, I would not. At the same time, there was Hannah Leverton. Hannah Leverton was a Quaker woman, one of those lovely white women that I would see in my visions. And she said to me, Harriet, Harriet, thou ought to be free when thou art ready to run to the north. I will give thee the directions to go. I have friends who will help you on the way. Oh, now children, you might be wondering, why didn't I go that next day? <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, I was so happy to hear her words and whenever I saw her. Oh, her family ran a meal. They were so wealthy and well-to-do. I sometimes would sell a pies and come by and sell her pies or whatever I could do. To hear her words gave me courage. It's hard to leave your mom and your father. It's hard to leave the only home I knew, even though I was a slave. What about my brothers and my sisters and their children, my friends? What is the North? What is Philadelphia? What is, what is freedom? I don't know what that is. But soon after that, by the time I was 27, I heard that Master Brodus was going to sell me and my two of my brothers. We were going to go on the auction block, on the courthouse steps in Cambridge, Maryland. Oh, no, 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 that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right. He ain't going to sell me. Told my brothers, and I told them we're running tonight. We started off, and I had, I went and saw Hannah Leverton. I got the names on a piece of paper. I can't read no write, but I got that paper. <coughs> and I gave her my quilt that I had made in exchange for all the information she gave me. And that night we set off. And we were just going and a running, and we had our stick because we were going in unknown territory. Don't my brothers. What's that over there? What's that over there? We go this way. No, we go that way. No, this. No, I know where to go. We go this way. I already marked the trail. No, no. And they carried me back. They carried me back into slavery. That was a Saturday night. Come Monday morning, I said, this is my last day as a slave. I said that. I had to tell somebody, some kind of cold to somebody. You just don't tell somebody that you leave it. But I had to let somebody know. Oh, I let Mary know she's my niece and she's working for Doc Thompson in, her, in his kitchen. Oh, I'm on my way over there. But there was so much going on, I couldn't talk to her. So I left this kitchen and came around to the front of the house. And there was Doc Thompson on his horse. Oh, most folk were scared of Doc Thompson. I've been hired out to him for a long time. There's some things he's done that's been good for me. He let me hire myself out and make some money. But I lifted my chin and put my shoulders back. I ain't can't sing the way I used to sing now. But this is what I sang because I just, I, I just had to go. And Mary in the kitchen, she heard me. All the slaves in the slave court, anyone still out in the field, I know they would 
hear me and they would tell my mama and my papa. They'd tell my brothers. Ooh, and I just started singing, farewell, farewell. I'm going to the promised land. Farewell, farewell. I'm going to the promised land. And I looked back to see what Doc Thompson was going to do.
Georgia, to Mississippi, or Louisiana, and we would totally lose all hearing of them. Just like my older sister, Lina, she was so thing. And my other sister, Soph, and another sister. Before I was born, they were all so thing. We don't know nothing about them. I can't even hardly remember their names. My brothers are not going to be sold. How can I get word to them? I had a friend. I had a friend write a letter for me. I could never cotton to no reading and writing. <laughs> now, children, I know. I know I should, but maybe I think I got hit in the head too much. But I do know my numbers. Ain't gonna let nobody cheat me out of, out of my money. No, sir. Mm -hmm. I know how to count that money. But I had him write. And he had it right in cold. Because he wrote it to Jacob Lawrence, who was a free man in Bucktown, Maryland. He was free and he was educated. He knew how to read and to write. So I wrote him a letter, and then the cold part said, give my love to the old folk. And tell my brothers to keep watching and praying. And when that good old ship of Zion come their way, they're supposed to get on board and sail away. <laughs> yes. And I signed it, William Henry, his adopted son who lived in the north. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So we mailed that letter, and Jacob later told me that the postmaster read all of his mail because they were sure that he was helping saw these slaves escape from the area. Well, he come in because they called him in. And they said, boy, he ain't no boy. He's a grown man. Boy, you read this here letter to me, and you tell me what it means. You got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. Give my love to the old folk. Well, ain't got no old folk. Tell my brothers, he ain't got no brothers. I was on my adopted son, and he ain't got no brothers. And the good old ship of Zion get on board. What the good old ship of Zion? This letter saying I'm about to die and go to heaven. Ain't about to die, I'm not ready to die. No, I don't know who this letter's from, what this letter's about. Nope, and he threw it down and he walked on out. <laughs> I couldn't have done it better. Then he went on his horse, and he went and told my brothers that old Moses was coming to get him, and they had to come, because he seen the signs himself that Robert, Henry, and Ben Ross for sale December 26, 1854, on the courthouse steps in Cambridge, Maryland, sold to the highest bidder, so that a chain gang was getting put together to take them further down to the south. So my brothers, they had to get ready. And I got my monies together as my abolitionist friends and the anti-slavery committees that I was all involved in in the north. They put their monies together. And I got me a train ticket from Philadelphia to Baltimore. Now kids, don't look so shy. I always took the train down from Philadelphia to Baltimore. No one's looking for a runaway slave going from the north to the south. <laughs> <laughs> the slave hunters looking for going from the south to the north. Nah, nah, nah. No one ever stopped me going from the north to the south. Got went down to 19 times. But I take the train down to Baltimore. And I know all the dark hands there in Baltimore. I know who's for slavery, who's not for slavery. And I get on one of their boats, and they take me down the river, down to Dorchester County, and I come out. And it was Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, right before Christmas Day. And I got a little boy, yeah, you go tell Ben that old Moses is here. Another boy, you go and tell Robert that Moses is here. Yes, another to die for you. You go tell my other brother that Moses is here. And meet me in the normal place. Well, that night, only two of my brothers showed up. 
I don't know where Robert was. He wasn't there with us. But Ben comes in <coughs> and come by himself. Ben brought his girl he wanted to marry. Mm -hmm. She was owned by Horatio Jones, that meanest, most wickedest master in Maryland. He wouldn't let them get married. <coughs> so he brought her to run out too. And then there was two or three other men who heard I was there and they had to run off too. So that night we were walking really fast because we can't wait for my brother Robert. I don't wait for nobody. When it's time to go, we go. So we're walking through the night all night and we're running and we're walking and our first stop on the Underground Railroad is Ben and Rick Ross's home. My papa and my mama. Ooh, yes be able to see them for the first time in five years. Should I let them know that I'm here? It would be the best Christmas present I could give to them to see me, to feel me, to touch me, to talk to me. Oh! Now, that would be the worst present I could give to them. Because on December 26th, when the slave catchers come and kick their door in and look for my brothers, they could tell by her face that she had seen me. And then they'd take her off to jail, and who knows what they would do to her, until she told them that she'd seen me too. No, no, no. I can't let them know that I'm here. I can't do that. So when we get, we got to Ben's house, old Ben's house. <coughs> and we hid in the corn crib. And the two men who were with us, they went to the door and got Ben out of bed. And he told them that there were some escaped slaves out in the corn crib. And he went and got food and he come to the corn crib and he opened up that door. He said, now, no, you all in there? I can't see you. I'm an honest man. When they come to see me and to find out if I seen y'all, I gotta say no. So I was say no, I didn't see you, and I can't see you. Here's your food. He put the food down, and he went back inside. And throughout that day, he'd come and bring food. Because my mama ripped. She was expecting Ben and Henry and Robert to come for Christmas dinner. She knew they were going to be sold off, and she had taken a hog and did everything you're gonna do to a hog. She did it. <laughs> Ooh, yes, she made sausage and bacon and ribs. It all up in the chitlins and everything you can think of. And throughout that day, we would look through the cracks in the walls of the corn crib and see her walking out down to the road and looking, looking for her sons, looking, hoping they would be coming. Going back in. We could see the grief and the worry just weighing her down. But we can't let her know that we are here. And at nightfall, it got so dark. And then he come on out and he tied a handkerchief around his eyes. And he touched us and he smelled us and he cried. And oh, he felt so good in my arms. And oh, oh. December 26, and they're saying, uh, uh, uh. They beat that door in, and only Rick was there. Where's those boys of yours? So, uh, they're supposed to come for Christmas dinner, but they didn't come. I, I, I didn't 
this here. And they had ribs and chains. And they got on their horses and they rode off. And they found Ben later on and asked him the same thing. And he said, oh, I didn't see them. They supposed to come for Christmas Day. But no, they didn't come. No, no, no. We got my brothers, the, all of them. Oh, <laughs> I didn't tell you, Robert did show up. <laughs> Robert showed up. Yes, yes, yes. What held him up? His wife was going to have a baby. <laughs> Her labor started, and he wanted to go get a granny. <laughs> the baby was coming too fast. And so he helped his wife, and he helped her. They had two other boys. And when the baby came, she named the baby. After me. Oh, yes, she did. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Ooh. But she knew Robert was up to something, that something was wrong. And she kept asking, Robert, what's wrong? What's wrong, Robert? What is it? And then she realized he was going to leave her. And all she could do was cry, Robert, don't forget about me and my babies. And he said, no, no. I'll send old Moses to come get you once I get settled in the, in the north. And then he laughed. <coughs> now, I don't know about that. Why didn't he come back and get her? <laughs> old Moses come back and get you. You know, I'll come back 19 times now. One person come back with me. <laughs> I'll come by myself. <laughs> but that's all right now because I wouldn't want none of them with me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I got one last thing to tell you. The Lord gonna give me some visions. Ooh, he gave me some visions. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that good old ship of Zion is coming. It's coming to pick me up. Ooh, and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I'm not. And I'm ready to get on board.